So, if you believe that science is the rational investigation of intelligent people in an organised manner, then you have no knowledge of science history whatsoever. Even the briefest look at science history will show you that science is far from that ideal. Because we have two things, we have the idea of something and the reality of something. If you go on holiday, I mean sure, holidays are great, but holiday advertisements invariably show a happy family skipping through the waves or a, a couple at midnight staring lovingly into each other's eyes in a tropical paradise. They never show you the cute at the airport. They never show you the small child vomiting over his mother. They never show you the hassle of getting there the sweaty business of the transfer, or the joys of having somebody scream for an ice cream all day long. There's a difference between the idea of a thing and the reality of a thing. And if you want to know about the reality of science, look at the history of science. In my mind, science is the combination of three things. First is that innate quality that we have where we ask ourselves, I wonder what would happen if. The second is the ability to write that down. And the third is, don't we just love to make rules? Put those three things together and you have science. So the history of science is full of people saying, I wonder what would happen if. And half the time, of course, it's not very useful to positively dangerous. But then writing it down, being able to communicate that to others, making rules that govern the behaviour of the science investigator, they don't govern science, they govern the behaviour of the science investigator, makes them look in certain directions. And a great example of this actually is the electric motor. But in 1675, a French astronomer, Jean Picard, working in Paris, noted sparks in his barometer. And he wrote to all his buddies about it. And it was picked up in 1679 by Francis Hawkesby. What Hawkesby did was get a globe of glass, attach it so it could be spun, and rub it hard. And when he rubbed it hard enough, what he got was sparks. And of course, that was absolutely fascinating to him. So just like Picard, he wrote to everybody about it, and it kicked off a century-long craze into the sparks. It was in 1720 when Francis Gray, who was spending his time polishing long glass tubes, because why wouldn't you do such a thing, noticed that that mysterious force that gave you sparks could be made to travel down bits of string. And the more you rubbed it, the weirder it got, and it would attract things to it, because that fascinated everybody, and everybody started doing that. But in 1745, that's when the Leyden jar came along. The Leyden jar is basically a big old capacitor, but it meant you could store this mysterious force and take it around and start poking it into things and doing stuff with it. And this is the bit that is the what if that I just love about the history of science. Because if you could stick this into something, people were sticking it into something. The one great one was um, uh, Germans. The Germans attached this uh, Hawksby machine to a chair, would give it a good old crank, and then if you sat a girl in there and gave that girl a kiss, of course, you would get a spark. And these sparks are meant to increase your sexual potency. There was a, a German um, investigator called Hausen, and what he did was hang small boys from the ceiling, attach them to a Hawksby machine, and see if they could light candles with their fingers. It went as far as Temple of Electrical Health, which was opened in London in 1780, when they attached a Hawksby machine to a bed. And they would crank up the bed, lay a girl on the bed who wanted to have a baby, and her lover would leap upon her and sparks would fly. So essentially, anything you could electrify, people were electrifying it. And it was obviously um, Galvani who was uh, interested in this, and he had some frog's legs because Everybody was poking everything else, why not poke some frog's legs? And he noticed that they twitched as he prodded at them with his scalpel, and he had them on a metal plate. And Volta re um, reasoned that there was something about the two metals. So he got stacks of metals, and, and he tried every single metal, and he eventually came up with the voltaic pile. So now, of course, we've got this portable um, 
electrical supply where we don't have to rub balls of anything for hours long to get it, you just stack them up and hey presto, and that really kicked things off. Now, it sort of came to an end of punting at it and hoping it would do something when somebody tried gunpowder and blew themselves to smithereens. They kind of got a bit more rational after that because, remember this is over 100 years, they'd basically been practicing doing all of this stuff, worked out some of the things it was great for, some of the things it was not so great for, and because of writing it down and making rules, then we had all these rules. Now, one of the rules, interestingly enough, was that if you got this electricity and you had it near a magnet, then the current state of knowledge, the current belief was it would do nothing. And it was in 1820 when Ersted was giving a lecture on this and he demonstrated that it wouldn't do anything when it promptly did. And of course, he was quite upset about that. But then he wrote a paper on it claiming that he discovered this, which... Well, he had, which had discovered this, and we had electromagnetism. And of course, that led directly to the Faraday motor. Now, the Faraday motor is a bit of wire hanging in some mercury. It's stunningly unimpressive. And a lot of these things are. I mean, these sparks that Hawksby was generating were just basically tiny. They weren't, weren't doing a lot. And if you are investigating something and you get a small effect that is unusual, the common reaction you get from people is, yeah, well, that won't light up New York. What's the point of that? Nothing will when you're first looking at it. So the first motors were just embarrassing. They were just a, a trick, really, a parlour trick to entertain people because it developed from there to being singly the most useful thing in a modern day life. And the electric motor is ubiquitous, but the electric motor began because of Jean Picard in 1675 in Paris. To me, Science is the interaction of those three fundamental things. Curiosity, asking that question, what if? Communication, talking to everybody about it, and then generating rules to govern that investigation. That's what I think science is. Now, invariably, it's not very impressive when you first notice it, to that question, or rather that statement, what's the use of this, is uh, I think perhaps one of the dumbest things I ever hear it's like asking Faraday, what's the use of this? It's like asking Volta, what's the use of this? But batteries and motors are just stunningly useful. And if those two guys had listened to that question and thought, yeah, they're right, I'm going to go to something else more interesting, we went years before we got to such things. So it's the dumbest question. If you're prepared to investigate, if you're prepared to use your curiosity and your creativity, then in my mind, Certainly from a historic perspective, you are engaged in science. Anyway, I thought I would share those thoughts with you because I'm about to do something on the Newman machine and that's a free energy machine and that is going to get people saying free energy, pa. Bear in mind that question what if, that investigation, that looking at something that may or may not be useful is valuable in itself and has been our experience of the world since we've been on the world. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.